Hello and welcome to the first episode of the MAPS Canada Expert Edition webinar series, The Ethnobotany of Psychoactive Plants. My name is Michael Oliver and I am your host for this mini-series. After two successful seasons of examining the psychedelic renaissance, MAPS Canada has decided to start a parallel mini-series with some of our experts. Each expert edition will feature a previous guest from past seasons in a four-episode mini-series. This series is open to anyone and we hope that you might feel inclined to share it with your friends if you enjoy today's episode. We do encourage donations if you're in a position to give and your support goes a long way in helping us work towards the legalization of psychedelics. MAPS Canada is a nonprofit charity that relies entirely on public donations to help us achieve our mission of expanding safe access of psychedelic medicines for all Canadians. To learn more about MAPS Canada, you can visit our website at www.mapscanada.org. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you're new to Crowdcast, I just wanted to tour you around a little bit. On the right, you can see uh, the general chat where you'll be able to chat with other members of the audience. And down below, you'll notice there's a tab there that says, ask a question. And so this is gonna be an important um, aspect of this series moving forward and for today as well. Um, if you have a question for Chris, for our speaker, what you can do is actually toss a question down there and questions that are upvoted Will, be, will rise to the top and those will be the questions that we prioritize. So you'll be able to vote on other people's questions as well. And so we're gonna save some time towards the end of this, um, this episode to actually go through some of those questions and we invite you to share as many questions as you would like. Episodes of this series will be recorded and available to watch again right here in Crowdcast. So if you miss an episode, you can still follow the invite link that you receive and just replay it right here in Crowdcast. If you have any questions at all regarding Crowdcast or the webinar as a whole, you can actually reach out to our webinar email at webinar at mapscanada.org. Now, for our first iteration of this series, we have a very special guest who will be sharing his wisdom and knowledge of plant medicine with us over the next few weeks. Each episode of this series will be focusing on different plant medicines, with today's episode spotlighting ayahuasca. Drawing upon more than 30 journeys to the Amazon and experiences with dozens of Amazonian shamans, it is my pleasure to introduce to introduce to you Chris Killam. Chris Killam is a medicine hunter, explorer, lifelong yogi, psychedelic advocate, and media personality. He has investigated medicinal plants among indigenous people globally for decades, from Siberia to the Amazon and to the Congo. Chris is the author of 15 books, including the international bestseller, The Five Tibetans, Ayahuasca Test Pilots Handbook, and The Lotus and the Bud, Cannabis, Consciousness, and Yoga Practice. Chris has appeared on over 2,000 radio and 500 TV programs, and the New York Times calls Chris part David Attenborough, part Indiana Jones. I personally first met Chris during the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference back in 2019 and was instantly inspired by his ability to captivate an audience through storytelling. Chris's zest for life, coupled with his extensive travel experiences, exploration, and dedication to his craft, makes him an extremely fitting first guest to have on an expert edition. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Chris Killam to the expert edition stage. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. That's a very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And I want to express my gratitude to MAPS Canada for hosting this four-part series, Ethnobotany of Psychoactive Plants. You know, ethnobotany is the study of the relationship between people and plants. And I've been very fortunate over the course of my career to investigate different plants in different countries, whether it's kava in Vanuatu or rhodiola in Siberia or zalu in Syria or whatever plant in whatever country um, for a good long time now and to really have the opportunity to understand the relationship and, and roles between plants and cultures. And <clears throat> excuse me, it is the case that psychoactive plants around the world play special roles in culture and society. So even though the greatest majority of my work actually has been with non-psychoactive plants, inevitably every place I go, I also encounter something that's used ceremonially or, or otherwise for some spiritual or div divinatory purpose. And so I really want to focus uh, today on ayahuasca of the hundred or so uh, 
ethnobotanical missions that I've undertaken, which really all have to do with helping to establish sustainable ethical trade with uh, medicinal plants, herbs, spices, fruits, uh, oil-bearing nuts and seeds, cosmetic ingredients. Um, in, in this work, I've seen how critically valuable psychoactive plants are in their respective cultures. And among the many uh, missions that I've undertaken, I've taken more to the Amazon than any other place. And that's because it's endlessly fascinating. It's sadly disappearing. It's a remarkable place in the world. It is nature's greatest medicinal treasure chest. And so what I want to do is take you on a little bit of a journey now uh, with a presentation and tell you a little bit about ayahuasca and uh, also kind of weave for you the, the situation that ayahuasca now faces in terms of what it is in society today, not so much what it has been in antiquity. Uh, I always like to start by acknowledging people who have been very important to me. When I first went to the Amazon in 1997, I lived on the river with a group of natives for a month there and traveled around investigating different shamans and actually went back a second time and did that again for another month. And that was where I really first got my feet on the ground, so to speak, with uh, the Amazon rainforest, the greatest rainforest on earth. And during my first trip there, I had occasion to meet a woman named Maria Sina. She was a 103 years old uh, Brazilian shaman. And I want to be clear about the word shaman. This is a Tungusic word. So basically it comes from the Evenk people uh, in antiquity who lived in northeastern Siberia. But it's so it has such a nice sound, I believe, and is so expressive of a person who travels freely back and forth between the phenomenal and spiritual worlds that it's been taken up as the primary descriptor by indigenous native people all over the world, from Siberia to Thailand to the Amazon. Uh, basically, a good shaman is somebody who is very freely able to trant to travel back and forth between the phenomenal and the spiritual worlds. And this woman, Maria Sina, when she met me, she directed me to bridge worlds. She directed me to share from one culture to another. She told me it was a very important mission to do. And from that point on, even though I had been doing that for a few years, that only spurred me on in this mission to share about people. Um, whether I'm in Syria, or Congo, or Vanuatu, or Peru, I never do this work by myself. I'm not just barging around in the jungle on my own, looking for plants and going, ha ha, I, I found it, you know? I work with talented people all over the world. There's always a team. In the case of Peru, um, my team on the left is Jaime Baca, who's one of the best boatmen along the Ucayali River corridor. Clayley Vargas, who is a, a senior uh, agroforestry student uh, in college in Pucallpa, who's also Shipibo and very valuable in helping us to get into the Shipibo neighborhoods. And on the right, Sergio Cam, who has been my primary South American traveling partner for 23 years. We've investigated over a dozen rivers together. Uh, we've been in probably a couple of hundred villages and uh, Sergio and I have, have gone all over uh, the Ucayali district and the Loreto district as well and up into the Napo district as well, investigating medicinal plants and spending time with indigenous people. There is, uh, in the rainforest, a vast pharmacy of plants. Um, Dr. Richard Evan Schultes, the great ethnobotanist from Harvard, described the Amazon rainforest as the healing forest. And we know that there are about 80,000 or so plants in that forest, so tremendous biodiversity. And I want to talk, before diving into ayahuasca completely, I want to talk a little bit about some of the agents that shamans use for spirit healing. Because their understanding is that when you are healing somebody, and I'm not talking about if you're healing a, a sprained knee and you need to apply a poultice, but if you're healing somebody 
uh, you really are focusing on their spirit, you're focusing on their soul. This is what needs to be nourished and guided. Um, shamans of South America often use San Pedro cactus. It may also be called Huachuma. This is Trichocereus pachanoi. Um, this grows all over the Andes, and I've been up in the Andes a lot because I've worked with maca for about 23 years up there. And as you go along the roads everywhere, you'll see San Pedro cactus, and it's beautiful when it's in bloom. San Pedro, like peyote, uh, contains mescaline, and uh, dry weight, San Pedro cactus has almost the same or slightly more mescaline than peyote cactus. So it has a biologically similar effect. But I do want to impress upon you from the start that with these plants, we're talking simultaneously the chemistry and the plant spirit, because every plant has a spirit. That spirit is unique to the plant, and that's how shamans and usually people who are being treated think about these plants. One of the most important plants in the shaman's pharmacy in the, per, in the Peruvian Amazon and in the Andes is coca, erythroxylum coca. Coca leaf uh, is rich in alkaloids, including the most famous alkaloid of them all, cocaine, which can be in present up to as much as 1% of the total weight of the leaf. Uh, but coca is a valuable agent. It is typically put into a quid, tucked into the corner of the mouth. And it's not really chewed exactly. It's sort of insalivated and sucked upon. And this gets a little bit of stimulation going. Those of you who have chewed coca, those of you who've had it in the Andes or drunk copious cups of it in uh, high Andean hotel lobbies know that you don't get high on this stuff. It's bracing, it's invigorating, uh, but coca is, is very much associated with the apus, the spirits of the mountains of the Andes, and for there it, op it, it occupies an, ex an esteemed position with, shaman with shamans and in shamanic ceremonies. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to mention, I think the slides need to be made full screen because we're, we're um, caught back on the title slide here. Do you mind just uh, either trying to reshare your screen or maybe click and enter full screen mode? Um, I, yeah, that's what I did. Um, okay. okay, maybe there was just a bug or something because it, it got us, it was on the, I think the first slide or something. So maybe try one more time and then that should work. All right, are, are you, do you have full screen? I'm on the side of Zoe. What's that? Uh, no, not yet. It's, That's not full? It's not showing us the full screen yet. We st no, it's showing us a, sh a slide of Zoe uh, with Estella Pangosa ritual title. Okay. But but I'm going to start the slideshow, Chris. I'm start I, the slideshow. I just restarted it again. Okay. I just went back to the very beginning, did the show, play from start. Okay. Are you getting whole screen? Uh, no, unfortunately, we're not getting whole screen at the moment for some reason. So it might be good in this case just to to not full screen it and just walk along the slides um, as they appear like on the sidebar, like without going into presentation mode. Uh, I don't know what that means. Like just exit the presentation mode or slides. Yeah, just like right, right now where you are, just go through the slides there. All right. Does this actually work for you? Is this better? Is this an improvement? Um, yeah, that's a bit of an improvement. I think it would be ideal to be able to um, present it somehow, but if that's not working, this is this works fine too. We can see the slides this way as well. Okay, okay, yeah. Sorry for that. I I don't no I don't know what the deal is with that. I mean, it just says play slideshow from start, but for some reason you're not seeing it that way. Yeah. Um. So one of one of the big allies of shamans is mapacho. Mapacho which is Nicotiana rustica, is uh, the Amazonian tobacco. It contains about 20 to 24 times the nicotine of the Virginiana tobacco that's used to make cigarettes. And uh, tobacco plays a very important role in the shaman's world and in ceremony. Um, it, it can be used for what's known as a soplar here. You see Estella Pangoza, who is a shaman, blowing smoke, in this case on, on my wife Zoe, 
Uh, the soplar is a, a ritual process. It may take five, 10 minutes. Uh, it often involves chanting. And um, you wind up in this sort of aura of tobacco. We also know that tobacco is increasingly popular as rapé, very, very finely, finely powdered and blown up into the sinuses for an immediate and radical mind-altering effect. Tobacco leaf can also be infused in water and then a bit of the water snorted the next day. And that is also very, very quick and uh, sort of remarkably painful uh, the way it stings when it gets way up in the sinuses. And, and the last other way to utilize a tobacco uh, is what's known as ambil, which is to make a very, very dense, concentrated tar-like extract of tobacco that you just touch with the tip of your finger, put that in your mouth, and it's also quite a radical and very quick uh, psychoactive effect. Other uh, methods that, that shamans use include things like ritual steams and flower baths. Here, this shaman, Rosa Martinez, in the Chanchamayo region of Peru, is steaming a man who came to her about a half a year or a year before, almost completely crippled with arthritis. And uh, in addition to doing ritual work with him and chanting over him and tobacco over him, she also did these ritual steams, which really helped to bring him back to greater function. Um, Another thing that shamans use, and this is typical and common throughout all types of ceremonies that shamans engage in, are ways of inducing trance. Some shamans use what are called a shakapa, a leaf rattle, a, a leaf fan, and this has a shushing sound, and it goes back and forth, and that may be used for a prolonged period of time in a chanting ceremony. My uh, shaman friend in Lima, Don Alejandro Alfaro, seen here, he's a, he's a Chavan shaman. So from the coastal tradition in the far north of Peru, he likes to use a rain stick. So this was during a San Pedro ceremony and people were pretty far out at this point. And he was using the rain stick to help people to get deeper and deeper into their visions. So with shamans, uh, the real focus on healing is healing the spirit, uh, taking the spirit on a journey. And so of all of these um, various methods, it's those that deliver that experience of a journey most powerfully that are the most, uh, most revered. And certainly ayahuasca is at the top of that list. Uh, to remind you of the origins of the term psychedelic, this came from Humphrey Osmond, the British psychiatrist in 1957, who uh, so sagely said to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. And in this case, the psychedelic in question is ayahuasca, otherwise known as la medicina, the medicine. Uh, and this is the only combinatory uh, psychedelic that we know of, and that is it takes two distinct plants to make the effect. Either plant without the other does not work. So we have Banisteriopsis copy, which is a very woody, fibrous vine, and we have Psychotria viridis, which is a non-ordinary looking leaf that grows on a kind of a common looking uh, bush. So Neither one of these is especially distinguished visually, yet together they form what may arguably be considered the most powerful psychoactive potion in the world. Um, I like to say that the contents of ayahuasca can revolutionize medicine, and I believe that that is already well underway. One of the things that has happened really for about the past 17 years or so with the great popularization of ayahuasca is that we've seen a much better understanding of what it can do for people. Previously, ayahuasca had been really the purview of people in tribal situations in indigenous native communities, but over time that has leaked out and more and more people seek ayahuasca for personal healing 
or for spiritual insight and revelation. And we know a great deal now about what happens in the brain and what can happen with sort of resetting different genetic uh, markers as a result of consuming ayahuasca. It turns out to be a very, very broadly beneficial potent potion, excuse me. So ayahuasca starts with what's known as the vine of the soul, Banisteriopsis copy. And you can see here, copy likes to grow on trees. It likes to wrap itself around trees. It likes to climb up trees. It likes to branch out and spread out on the canopies of trees and go from one tree to another. So when you're in the forest, where copy is prolific, you see it all through the trees, moving from one to another. So it becomes quite tangled. Uh, but this is the vine of the soul. This is what is so highly revered in the brew. Um, in, in copy, uh, harmala alkaloids, including harmine and harmaline. And here you have on the right-hand side, the first copy bush I ever saw. This was back in 97. I was living with uh, native people in Brazil. I went up the Negro, or Rio Negro with a shaman friend and uh, we stopped in a village and we were asking about ayahuasca and this man showed us this particular vine. So this is the first time I saw anything related to ayahuasca in the Amazon. But these harmala alkaloids are clever because they are, uh, they actually deactivate what's known as the monoamine oxidase system in the body. And one of the things that the MAO system does is prevent DMT from being orally active. DMT is present in thousands of plants in our environment. We consume DMT a little bit here, a little bit there all the time. It really does nothing to us. But when you take the harmala alkaloids, that suppresses the MAO system and that allows DMT to be orally active. It's a very, very clever thing. Uh, and what is used in combination with Banisteriopsis copy typically is Chacruna, uh, Psychotria viridis. You can see it, these beautiful, shiny, kind of rubbery green leaves. It's a lovely plant. I caught this uh, when, it, when it had gone to seed. Uh, and, and what's funny about Chacruna is if you were to take a walk in the forest and you were to just look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bushes and look at Chacruna among them, you would not say it was especially distinguished looking one way or another. You would not say, oh, that's the one that I would pick out to put in a psychoactive potion if I were hoping that I could discover something that would induce visions. You would never think to do that. And yet we have the issue of indigenous of ingenious indigenous pharmacology. And the question that remains among many people, but certainly not among shamans, is how did anybody think to take one of a few thousand vines that grow naturally in the Amazon, many and most of which like to grow up trees and all over trees, and the leaf of one particular plant and put them together in such a manner as to make a profoundly powerful medicine. Now, reductionists will tell you, clearly it's a matter of trial and error, but the uh, number of possibilities is something like 16 billion to one. The shamans tell you a very different story. The plants told us, that's what they say. The shamans insist that the plants communicate with them, that they communicate clearly, that they explain their purposes, and they help to guide the shamans in preparation of various plant medicines. So here we have two completely different explanations of how ayahuasca came to be. Uh, DMT, the spirit molecule, the so-called spirit molecule, acts on receptors in the brain, it cracks open interdimensional barriers, and then what ensues includes typically visions, uh, deep experience, and other phenomena. Um, it is remarkable 
that this was figured out by anybody, and especially in a place that's so chaotically and heavily foliated as the Amazon rainforest. So now I'd like to take you kind of through the chain of trade a little bit here uh, and show you some things about what ayahuasca is today. Remember, this is about the relationship between the plant and people. This is about what's happening with people out there, both people who are involved with the, the vine and the leaf from an agricultural standpoint or a shamanic standpoint, or who are utilizing this ceremonially one way or another. So I'd like to take you um, to the southeastern part of Peru uh, along the uh, Rio Tamaya. This is uh, here. I didn't, I didn't say this out loud. This is uh, just a shot of the front of our boat as we're making our way way out the Rio Tamaya, um, heading toward the Brazilian border. Uh, this is a sparsely populated area. It's very, very popular for coca production. A lot of cocaine is being made and, and cooked on the uh, uh, river sides of this river, so it's not an entirely safe place. A lot of bandits, uh, some very beautiful villages. But what concerns us is a place that lies oh, four or five hours out on the Rio Tamaya, and that is Lago Emiria, which is Peru's ayahuasca breadbasket. And it is here that we have the greatest concentration of Banisteriopsis copy of vine in Peru. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, my Peruvian team and I spent two years conducting an ayahuasca sustainability survey to assess the state of, um, excuse me, especially the state of the vine in the wild and also cultivated. And the place that we went to that had by far the most vine of any was Lago Emiria. So it all starts in the forest around Lago Emiria, around this vast inland lake with um, harvesters like this man, Antonio Cowper. He's been harvesting ayahuasca for about, I guess, 24 years or so. Feeds his family, makes a contribution to the village in which he lives as a result. Uh, and he regularly goes into the forest and harvests, oh, maybe... 20 or 30, uh, 25 kilo bundles of vine, puts them onto a boat and brings them back to his village, which in this case is a village called Hunin Pablo. So here you have maybe a two days worth of work. Uh, he goes out with his son Nixon very often. They go into the forest, they cut vine, they tie it up. Remember, however <clears throat> far you go into the forest to cut vine, that much further you have to come out with the vine, carrying it on your shoulders. So there's only so far in that you can really go. Uh, but this is how the whole chain starts. This is how uh, the very beginning of the process by which, by which people wind up with ayahuasca to drink. Uh, these days, the situation with ayahuasca is very different than what it used to be. You have two huge Brazilian churches, Unayo de Vegetal and Santo Daime, each boasting of hundreds of thousands of followers who are consuming ayahuasca in uh, church-like ceremonies uh, that are often highly structured. Um, so you have a huge proliferation of ayahuasca that way. And also as a result of interest in ayahuasca on the part of foreigners whose native tradition is not ayahuasca, who are, you know, Europeans and Asians, Americans who go to the Amazon to drink ayahuasca. This has also uh, spawned activities throughout much, much larger communities. So for the most part, what I've seen in my couple of decades of investigating this in uh, the Amazon is that this has been largely beneficial for native communities. Um, the vine typically travels very far here, about six hours or so from Hunin Pablo, where I just showed you uh, Antonio Cowper bringing vine in, in a boat. You have a porter unloading some of that vine from a transport boat in the port of Pucallpa. 
Pucallpa and Iquitos are the two major Peruvian river ports in the Amazon. Peruvian uh, Pucallpa to the south, Iquitos greatly to the north. Um, and Pucallpa is the larger of the two ports. So there's a tremendous amount of commerce going in and out of Pucallpa. Uh, those of you who are familiar with South America know that the most common mode of transport for nearly anything is the moto taxi. And so here it's typical and common for vine to be offloaded from a, a rapido, from a transport boat, and then carried on to motos and then brought to people who make ayahuasca, people who are running ayahuasca centers, uh, shamans who periodically buy a small amount to make their own for ceremonies that they do in their villages. Uh, it, it's quite diverse what's happening out there with the vine and also with the leaf. Um, this man, Jimmy Rojas, lived out in the forest. He lived in a forest village. He was a village shaman. At one point, he moved his family to the Yaranacocha district of Pucallpa. He makes about 30 or 40 liters of ayahuasca every month. Um, a couple of centers in Peru rely on his ayahuasca. He has a very good reputation. And so he chose to be in a place where there were more amenities and services, better schools, better access to medicine. And rather than being the village shaman, really focus on being a superb cook, if you will, of ayahuasca. So here is the making of ayahuasca. Um, here, um, a, an old friend, Hilbert, who makes ayahuasca at the Nihui Rao uh, Center in Peru, uh, is pounding vine. The vine, as I said, is very thick and fibrous. If you want to cook the ingredients out of it, if you want to get the harmala alkaloids out of it, you really have to pound it. You have to smash it up a bit. So that's what Hilbert is doing right here. And there is a standard procedure for making ayahuasca. And it is to layer the vine and then leaf and then vine and then leaf and then vine and then leaf and to fill it with water. So you see here, Hilbert's pounding a lot of vine and making a base of that. And that gets placed in the pot. Uh, you want to make sure that the vine is clean. You want to make sure that the leaves are clean. As much as possible, you want the ayahuasca brew when it is finished to be without grit, to be without sediment, uh, to be without anything unwanted in it, certainly. Uh, you can't expect it to taste good because it never does. Um, here you see after uh, vine has been added to the pot, the next thing is the chacruna, the leaf has been added. And you do this layering until it is all the way to the top. Um, here at Los Cielos, which is a place a couple of hours outside of Pucallpa, um, when we were doing our ayahuasca sustainability survey, I asked everybody their recipe for making ayahuasca. And for the most part, they were, you know, uh, three to two or, or uh, three to four uh, it'd be, be, say, three parts vine, two parts leaf, four parts vine, three parts leaf. But at Los Cielos, which is what I have pictured here, they actually use more chacruna than they do vine in their ayahuasca. And that is one of the reasons that they boast that no matter who you are, if you drink this ayahuasca, you will have visions. And it certainly is true because there's just a tremendous amount of chacruna in their recipe. I do want to say that I was very surprised and gratified that during the entire survey that we did, asking people how much vine they buy, what they pay, what their recipes are, on and on and on, people were very free with information. Nobody withheld that. And that was really helpful in our, in our understanding of what's going on in the scene out there. So after you layer the vine and the leaf, you pour the water to the top of the pot. Recipes for ayahuasca vary. 
uh, Don Alberto Davila, for example, who's a very well-known shaman, a mestizo shaman, so not a, a member of any particular tribal group, uh, uses 12 different plants in his ayahuasca recipe. So you have the copy, you also have the chacruna, and then you have tree barks, you have a little bit of brugmansia, you have some tobacco, and it is a remarkably powerful and sparkling, as one person said, ayahuasca. So you cook this down, you cook it down for a long time, six, seven, eight hours, you boil it down, you evaporate that water, you just keep making it thicker and thicker and thicker. It is typical and common for a shaman to hang out at the pot of ayahuasca, to chant over it, maybe periodically to take the top of the pot off, smoke a mapacho, soplar the ayahuasca, ask the spirits of the medicine to bless this particular pot of ayahuasca. That is also part and parcel of it. This is not a mechanistic chemical thing. This is an engagement with plant spirit. So during the making of the ayahuasca, the shaman engages with plant spirit and calls on the spirits for a successful batch of ayahuasca and successful journeys. After many hours of cooking, the plant material is removed from the pot and whatever liquid remains continues to be cooked down. And eventually, you get down to something that looks like this. Now, those of you who have drunk ayahuasca can probably already taste it at the back of your throats. Uh, you know what this is like. It is thick, it is bitter, it is intense, and it is plant spirit medicine pure and simple. And what do I mean by that? Everything, everything has an energetic signature. And plants have, excuse me, powerful and profound energetic signatures. We have co-evolved with plants throughout all time. We eat them, we drink their juices, we wear their fibers, we use them as medicines, we use them ceremonially, we adorn our homes with them, we build with them, we do so many things with plants. And these energies, these energies that the plants carry are the plant spirits. And the shamans learn to tap into the power of the plant spirits and utilize that energy, harness that energy to help harmonize the person who needs healing, harmonize the person who's seeking a vision, harmonize the person who's trying to integrate. Ayahuasca uh, ceremonies typically take place in malocas. Malocas tend to be round buildings with uh, palm leaf tops, very airy, usually uh, screened in all around, so there's a good airflow. And this will be where in the evening you will drink ayahuasca to go on a spirit healing journey. Uh, this is not an, an atypical maloca. Uh, you can see that there are mats scattered around for people to lie on or to sit on during ceremony. So you'll typically have the shaman at one end or another of this room and then everybody else all around. And throughout the evening, you'll sit on a mat, you'll generally stay inside the maloka and you'll have your journey experience. And one thing I do want to say is that I thought, um, I used to hear in the very beginning when I started drinking ayahuasca, shamans talked about uh, creating layers of protection and in the maloka and keeping that sealed with, with healing energies. And I remember going out to the banyo one night and walking back into the maloka and on the outside, the door just looked like a door. And as soon as I opened it up and I looked inside, I could see all along the walls of the maloka this beautiful geometric grid of protective light and energy. And then look again outside, nothing inside, really something. So it is all about plant spirit medicine. Very often a mesa is set. I've seen this in a number of places and with a number of shamans, uh, both in the Amazon and in the Andes, an aggregation of ceremonial objects, often crystals, candles, bones, jewelry, other things, uh, sacred objects, other things that may be of special spiritual significance, 
or something that you want to be imbued with special significance. You might put a piece of jewelry into the mesa for the evening exactly to get it charged up. That's the understanding people have. Um, at the beginning of an ayahuasca ceremony, generally the shamans will sit and they will chant and blow into the ayahuasca itself. So here, it's kind of, it's kind of typical, you know. Uh, there's some very nice pottery in the Amazon, but almost every shaman carries their ayahuasca in a plastic soda bottle. Uh, it's never really made a lot of sense to me. But here you have a shaman blowing into uh, the bottle, blowing into the spirits, calling the spirits of the plants into this bottle of brew for the purposes of providing people with a good and beneficial and high and integrating journey. Uh, shamans vary tremendously. Here on the left, you have Lucio Azamana, and on the right, Ricardo Amaringo. Um, I first drank with them, oh, I don't know, 14 years ago or so. Uh, they are both maestro shamans. Lucio lives way the heck out in the country and is very, very hard to get hold of. Uh, Ricardo Amaringo uh, studied for many, many years with Guillermo Arevalo, one of the best known of all shamans uh, alive today. And Ricardo is, is just staggering in, in his own right. Uh, these two are both highly trained. They've spent decades refining their craft. And in ceremony, they have the ability to take you out and bring you back in a remarkable journey that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Here I am with Don Lucio Azamana. This is, I don't know, I guess about 12, 13 years ago or so. Um, shamanism has been largely revived in many parts of the Amazon as a direct result of the popularization of ayahuasca. Ay ayahuasca, until it was really, until it really started to catch on about 15 or so years ago, 17 years ago, shamanism was very much on the decline. People didn't want to stay in native villages and learn herbalism from grandma and hope that somebody would come along and maybe they could earn a little bit of a living by doing some healing. It's very, very different now with the interest in ayahuasca, with people sealing, seeking healing that they're not getting from pharmaceuticals. People are turning to the shamans of South America. They are turning to ayahuasca. And so you have somebody like Rolando Tongoa. Um, he is not tribal. He's mestizo. Um, he's somebody I've been in ceremony with a great many times. He's a spectacular shaman. He would not be earning a living. He would not be feeding his family as a shaman if, it not, if not for the popularization of ayahuasca, for the spread of the medicine beyond its borders. Estela Pangoza, Shipibo uh, Maestra, tremendous, runs an all-woman center, Aya Madre, and she also goes around to villages in her free time and does healing work with women who can't afford it. Um, this is somebody who's very service-oriented. She has carried the tradition of healing that she learned from her father since the time she was a little, little girl. Uh, she has been working in ceremony for decades now, and she's done doing something remarkable with her all-woman center, Aya Madre, and expressing the medicine in a way that makes it very easily easy for women especially who've undergone traumas and may really want a woman's guidance and counsel in a center to have that kind of refuge to go to. <clears throat> uh, Temple of the Way of Light, which is another one of the very popular centers in Peru, um, almost always has more women shamans than men, uh, really trying to counterbalance the disproportionate number of, of men who seem more prominent in the psychedelic scene and in the shamanic scene, because you have spectacular women shamans out there. Um, the one on the right uh, with the headband, Laura, in the dark, if she sits down in front of you to sing, even if you can't see her, as soon as she opens her mouth and just sings a couple of notes, you know it's her because you get hit by this wave of love. She's known as the goddess of love. She has a special and unique talent 
for conveying that and for just blowing your heart open. These are the talents of the shamans. These are the medicines that they bring into the ceremonial space. So the ceremony typically takes place in the evening. Here you can see it's after dark now. Uh, we're getting ready to drink ayahuasca. You drink the brew, and those of you who have drunk ayahuasca know that this is not something you sip and savor. This is something that you bang back as quickly as you possibly can. Ayahuasca is, no, nobody ever says, wow, gosh, that is really delicious ayahuasca. Somebody might grudgingly say, it doesn't taste that bad tonight. But in general, it's harshly bitter. Uh, that is due to the alkaloids in it. Uh, it is rough to get down sometimes. It is also known as La Purga, the purge, because very often it comes back up or out one way or another, cleansing and purifying your body, even as it takes your psyche for a ride. There is something very common to the ayahuasca experience, and that is the ayahuasca geometry. You see this reflected in Shipibo textiles like this one here. You also see it on, tech, on pottery. And when you go into uh, Pucallpa, for example, the mun municipal government buildings have this ayahuasca geometry all over them as decor. So this is something that is not only fundamental and intrinsic to the Shipibo people, although you see a similar, if, if not identical, geometry among the ayahuasca-drinking Ashanika people as well. Uh, but this is something that you very, very typically see when you drink ayahuasca. What it is specifically about the brew that manifests this particular type of geometry, I really cannot say. One of the features of... Uh, ayahuasca shamanism uh, is the Ikaros, the healing songs. The Ikaros uh, convey the spirit of the plants of all different types. It is typical and common for a shaman to have dieted, that is, become intimately familiar with certain plants and therefore be able to call on the spirits of those plants in the form of these Ikaros, these sacred songs. Um, Hamilton Souther, who's a, a gringo shaman, uh, who one time was talking and he said, shamans are masters of trance. And it's really true. It is the trance of the Ikaros. It's the tempo. It's the rhythm. It's the pace. It's the tone that helps to carry you out as the ayahuasca comes on. It's these songs that help to carry you far into the spirit world. And spirit world sounds like a myth, sounds like an idea, sounds like a fantasy, sounds like a notion until you drink the ayahuasca. And then you discover that, oh, in fact, there really is a spirit world. And the idea is to navigate in that world, to get answers to questions, to get healing for hurts, um, to, to figure out things, to become more and more integrated as you go along. And the songs are extremely powerful as part of this process. <clears throat> the great Shipibo artist Pablo Amaringo was spectacular for painting the landscapes that he saw, the visions that he saw, the way he saw them. I had good fortune to drink with Pablo and to spend a few days around him many years ago. Um, but this is a, a typical, if spectacularly beautiful example of the visions. And what happens in visions is that you might see something that just by virtue of how it presents itself puts into order something in your psyche, something in your mind, something in your heart that maybe has been out of order previously. And traumas, old wounds, deep pains can be healed and eased, and your energy is brought into balance with this remarkable medicine. You might meet allies. It is very typical and common to meet uh, anacondas, to meet jaguars, to meet hummingbirds, to meet crickets, to meet, liz meet lizards of different kinds. Um, I meet an anaconda very often and have from the beginning. The anaconda talks to me. It shows me things. 
Um, it has been quite extraordinary being with that. Other people are attracted to other things. Um, one of the things that does happen in the ceremonial space often, and this confounds reductionists, is that people will share visions. Many occasions I've been in a ceremony and all of a sudden somebody said, hey, like, what's with all the snakes? And there will just be hundreds and hundreds of snakes or spiders or something else. Uh, but very often there are shared group visions. And that's also sort of an extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, this painting by Martina Hoffman, who is one of our wonderful living visionary artists, gives a sense of the luminosity that people often feel. Very often the uh, most exalted experiences in ayahuasca ceremony are accompanied by a tremendous sense of bright, bright, radiant light. This is a feature of uh, a, a typically very joyful ceremony, a healing ceremony, something that takes you deep into your own sense of spirit and something that you are navigated into and around and through and eventually back out of thanks to the skills and the talents of the shamans. Um, uh, a Hawaiian elder once said that uh, true healing puts into order the body, the mind, and the spirit with the past, the present, and the future. Um, spirit healing really is possible. Putting all of these things together is possible. And while I would never suggest or imply that ayahuasca can heal all of the ills of the world or can answer all of the questions of the world or can solve all of the spiritual riddles of the world, it can go a long, long way toward helping people into a deep and abiding sense of healing and balance. And this is due to the thoroughness of the thing. When you are in the thrall of ayahuasca, when you are deep in the ceremonial experience, no part of you is left behind. Very often people have this unity consciousness experience, this mystic experience. It is the classic mystical experience, a sense of being one with absolutely everything of your own personal ego boundaries dissolving. Uh, what is happening at that very same time is that, that you're expressing new neural connectivity, many dozens or hundreds of new ways of behaving and responding, responding to circumstances that you might otherwise have previously responded to in a very limited way. Um, but this, this mystic experience is the very heart of healing itself. In an LSD study um, in, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I think it was about 20 years ago now, a study of alcoholics. Uh, when LSD was used, <clears throat> excuse me, when LSD was used to treat alcoholics, the people who had the greatest success staying away from alcohol after a result of LSD therapy were those people who had the greatest mystic experiences. The ones who felt dissolved into absolutely all and everything were the ones who stayed off alcohol the best. In the Johns Hopkins uh, Medical Center study of terminal uh, cancer patients, uh, those who had the strongest spiritual experiences, those who had that mystic experience of dissolving into all and everything lost their fear of dying. And that is a remarkable thing when a person is stage four in cancer. Um, just to round this out a little bit, ayahuasca is plant spirit medicine. Two things are going on with ayahuasca. One is this ingenious biochemical activity as a result of a potion uh, remarkably well designed to contain both harmala alkaloids and DMT, which is rendered orally active as a result of the harmala alkaloids. But the second thing is the plant spirits themselves, the spirits of the vine, the spirits of the leaf, 
the spirits of any other ingredients that may be added in, and the spirits that the shaman brings in with the Icaros, maybe spirits of tobacco, spirits of chuchuhuasi, spirits of cat's claw, many different things. It is the spirit, it is the spirit of the plants that really does the healing. If you'd like to know more about uh, my work with ayahuasca, you can uh, get my book, uh, Ayahuasca Test Pilots Handbook. And um, now I'd like to switch back and uh, go ahead and answer some questions. Let's see how I get out of this. There we go. Am I back? Am I back? Just one, two. Uh, not hearing you yet. Hello. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not hearing you. Your your mic is muted, Michael, I can see. Oh, Michael. Well, while we wait for Michael, I can uh I can uh this is Kenny. I can answer the, the ask the first question for you. Sure, <laughs> well, sure, sure. Back. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> the first one we have here is from Teresa. With the increased international popularity, are there sustainability concerns as well as other negative impacts on the communities? There are sustainability concerns with regard to um, ayahuasca vine. Um, that's why my team and I spent two years doing a, a sustainability survey in uh, Loreto and Ucayali provinces. Now, keep in mind that the two largest groups dispensing, dispensing ayahuasca in the world today, uh, Unayo de Vegetal and Santo Daime, cultivate their own ayahuasca they cultivate their own chacruna. They make their own. They dispense their own. There are zero sustainability concerns. What we've seen uh, in the areas where ayahuasca is very popular right now and where there are many ayahuasca centers is that in some villages, in some easy-to-access areas, uh, vine has been, in many cases, picked out completely. At the very same time, we're seeing more and more people cultivate vine. And this is consistent what I've seen with what I've seen with other crops um, like ashwagandha in India, like rhodiola in uh, Siberia and China that uh, get harvested in the wild for a good long time. And then as those supplies start to dwindle, people go ahead and cultivate. So yes, I would say that there are sustainability issues the popularization is unquestionably put pressure on these plant populations, but um, I think that cultivation uh, is going to really see us through long term, just as it has for the two largest users of ayahuasca in the world. Thanks so much for answering that, Chris. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Great, thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so on to the next question that we have here. We have a question from Camilo Cortez who asks, how do you think we need to adapt in the Western world to include ayahuasca and other medicine substances into our way of life? I think one of the things that we need to do is to keep strong our connection to nature in every way we possibly can. I understand that many people live in urban environments and they can't just go out and take a walk in the forest. I have the privilege of doing that every single day. Uh, but I do believe that keeping as strong a connection to nature as possible is important. I also think that, you know, it, it's very hard. We are mechanistic in, in so many respects. Uh, and yet this is really plant spirit healing. And, and I think that Many people imagine that plant spirit is a metaphor, okay? That it's it, that it me really means something else, and no, it really actually doesn't mean something else. And well, I'll I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, the first time I I was in the Amazon, I was uh, living with native people in in Brazil and going around looking looking at shamans and meeting with different shamans and all the shamans i met the first couple of years were women it was really a, an interesting experience for me and i i went to this one shaman and she said oh let me let me uh you know check you out 
So she went out back of her house and she came back with this little, little, tiny little plant and it had the roots and she sat me down and she started touching me on the head and shoulders with this and chanting and then she stopped and she told me this very, very detailed thing about something going on in my work life that she could not have known, not at all. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know what I did for work. She eerily described something that was happening with two people. And I said to her, <coughs> Edna, how do you know this? And she laughed and she said, I don't know it. She said, you see the roots? She's pointing to the roots of this little plant, Basurinha. The name of the plant is Little Broom. She says, I touch you with the plant. The roots know. The plant sends the knowledge here. Then it goes here. Then I tell you, you understand? And I wow. said, yes, Edna, now I understand. Wow, that's amazing. Is it's Vaso plant spirit. Vasurina it's psychoactive? Vasurina is not psychoactive. It's just called little broom. And, and, and it's typical and common. You'll see these shamans, especially this, these women, they'll pick a whole little Vasurina plant and then they'll read you with it. Huh. Yeah, it's very cool. That's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. The next question that we have uh, lined up here on Crowdcast is, clearly the methods of the indigenous South American shamans were quite well developed and successful. What role do you believe the indigenous peoples of South America and their ceremony methods should slash will play in our development of therapeutic methodologies for use in healing with ayahuasca in the Western world? So similar to the last question, but. Well, you know, um the truly trained shamans have very specific methods uh methods of induction for example i mean when you uh you know methods of intent um there are, are times in ceremonies when the maybe the ikaros will really get going and they're kind of driving the energy they actually have methodology okay i mean don uh um, not Don Alberto Davila. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, Alejandro Alfaro in uh, Lima spent some time teaching me about ceremony and um, basically laying out kind of a, a beginning and middle and end to a, a trajectory of how a ceremony can go to be sort of conclusive for that time. And what I think is that we can learn from the shamans uh, methods that are sound and safe. I also think that we, um, you know, we're, we're challenging this traditional use. What is happening now with UDV and Santo Daime and people going to Peru or people going to Costa Rica or... Um, you know, <clears throat> people traveling around the United States or Canada or Europe or whatever and uh, pouring ayahuasca, this hasn't happened before. This is new in history. So we're also figuring out those roles. I mean, I believe that those people who are multi-generational shamans who are very well trained have a lot to teach us. Uh, and have a lot to teach us about how to connect with plant spirit, how to, how to hold space, how to be part of the healing experience. That's what I believe. And I think that as we drift further and further and further into the pharmaceuticalization of uh, the psychedelics and further into the eye shade, soft furniture, soft music, spring water, you know, uh, you know, dim lights thing, the more we kind of lose that connection. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd much rather see people, you know, tripping naked on the beach on mushrooms and playing Frisbee than too many people stuffed in some sort of a, uh, you know, a therapeutic clinic someplace with eye shades on, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, like, fair. you know, look, look, this is nature, okay? Mm -hmm. And I understand uh, and appreciate that this is a new time and we're coming back around at these psychedelics in ways that 
uh, researchers did by the thousands in the 1950s. Okay, we're rediscovering what they figured out a long time ago about clinical settings uh, and the utilization of psychedelics in, in ceremony, but what they didn't have and they weren't utilizing and they weren't turned on to was the indigenous native knowledge and the plant spirit understanding. So I think the extent to which we can dive into that, we can learn more about that, we can hew to that, the better off we'll be in terms of having some sort of a balance with these medicines. Wow, thank you for sharing that, so, so interesting. There's so many things I wanted to touch on there. We've got lots of questions though, so maybe I'll move on. But one thing I did wanna maybe ask you on was, you mentioned induction. Um, and I think typically the scientific method relies on deduction to make its claims. And so I'm curious if you might be able to speak a little bit more to like how induction that shows up in the process and in the methodologies of uh, the shamans that you've worked with. Well, look, you're, you're in ceremony, it's dark, there are frogs croaking outside, there's something hooting in the forest, you've just drunk this hideous tasting stuff that's roiling around in your stomach like hot gasoline, um, you know, and you're getting off and you're seeing stuff and then the shaman's going, <sighs> and you start to be carried out. <laughs> That's the induction. Mm. That's the opening. That's the invitation. Shamans like uh, Lucio Azamana, whose face I showed back there ways, the guy sits down, starts to sing and blammo the spirit world just plain opens up. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what happened here? And he just goes, here, help yourself. He just has that natural talent, that ability to just dissolve the barriers and say, here you go, take your journey. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I think that while deduction is very, very valuable. We learn a lot from scientific method. We learn about new neural connectivity. We learn about uh, epigenetic modification. We learn about how anti-inflammatory you know, markers go down. We learn about all kinds of things about readjustment of neurotransmitters in the brain. This is all really good, valuable stuff. Um, but it is not to be confused with the immersive journey experience, okay? Mm -hmm. In other words, we can talk about this experience by saying yes, and then in that, when you're feeling that spaciousness, that's a result of your 100 billion neurons basically having Woodstock in your head. You know, we can talk about that. Um, but this is a journey. And, and I just hope that as we go along, accruing the, the unquestionable therapeutic benefits of these agents, mm -hmm. that we do not lose the wild. Mm -hmm. Because it is the wild that is really the driver here. And, and what do I mean by that? Um, you know, I've been in some barking mad ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, when I started drinking, I was drinking at a Spiritu de Anaconda, and their deal was six nights a week, you drink ayahuasca, you drink as much as you possibly can, and then you rest a night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we we're like, yeah, all right, gung ho, we'll do that. And, um, you know, and also learning about dozens and dozens of other medicinal plants at the same time. Uh, you know, all of that was happening too. But the point is, it was massive, intense, profound, powerful ceremonies night after night after night. And, and I personally believe that there is tremendous value um, it, if you're made of the stuff that enjoys this sort of thing, that there's tremendous value in going as far out as you can in exploring those borderlands, in 
crossing the boundaries deep, deep into the spirit world, of learning to navigate that. That's what the shamans do. And they basically invite you to do the same thing. That's very interesting. I feel like that ties back into your personal philosophy around like cognitive liberty. I remember mm -hmm. you've spoken to that a lot um, in your presentations and- um, Sure. Yeah, maybe something, do you think you'd be able to speak to that briefly? Yeah, I'd be happy to, um, you know, uh, we should and should have the right to explore our minds as we wish. Uh, I mean, Terrence McKenna said a good thing. He said, every man is his own Magellan in his own living room. Uh, I would add women in there. But basically, the gist of it is you should be allowed to navigate and explore your own consciousness. And we have prohibitions against that. And we have prohibitions against that because authoritarian figures are afraid of the unknown and this is just nothing but a great big parcel of unknown okay <laughs> this is as unknown as it gets yep. um and you know you remember the the famous um <clears throat> lsd studies in in the united states uh, army where they gave acid to soldiers and then they gave them orders and <laughs> the soldiers are like screw that <laughs> You know, they just walked off, you know, um, and, and this is not the kind of thing that authoritarian structures want, you know, authoritarian figures want is this immense cognitive liberty. But the human mind is this vast, vast, vast place and the human spirit, you know, that essential what it is that is at the very absolute infinite core of our being that's something that we can tap into this wellspring of life this wellspring of inspiration this wellspring of energy and force and stamina and healing and integration and harmony um and it does take going far out to get there you know this is not a microdosing situation this is not a, yeah, man, you know, I just do a 30 second of a teaspoon of ayahuasca and just <laughs> contemplate the plant spirits. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about full out balls to the wall tripping. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for sharing uh, graciously sure. to that. <laughs> sure. It's a, it's a great point to, to, <clears throat> to share. So we have some other questions here I'll have to touch on. So Sheriff Ashur has asked, how has the ayahuasca spiritual journey changed through time? Is there a distinction between the types of journeys for shamans, locals, and tourists? Well, <clears throat> certainly the accounts that we have, <clears throat> I mean, actually one of the best accounts of ayahuasca is one of the funniest accounts I've ever heard. And that was Richard Spruce in the 1800s. He was in the Amazon and he wound up at a gathering, I believe it was in Colombia, where they drank ayahuasca, they did psychoactive snuff, they gave him a, a mapacho cigar that was as big as his forearm, they had him drink some pisco, they had him drink some coffee, they, they just did this whole series of things, and, and it was this great big wild kind of semi-in-control, semi-out-of-control psychedelic party. Um, that is a way that ayahuasca has been utilized ceremonially. We also know that in other circumstances, people in villages, people in small native groups would get together uh, either because somebody needed healing or a question needed to be answered, a problem needed to be solved. Um, you know, all of that is, is part and parcel of the ayahuasca experience. I think what's um, <clears throat> what's different now is that as people who are not from uh, South America and people who are not from the Amazon go to drink or drink wherever they are going to be in Costa Rica or Jamaica or whatever, um, we're bringing entirely different um, frames of reference entirely different minds really uh to this you know we're we're not brought up in the forest uh we're not 
brought up in, in these particular tribal groups. We come from a different situation. Uh, so I think that not only are we sort of redefining and reshaping the use of the medicine, but I also think that the shamans very clearly are adjusting to and adapting to us. Mm. We're not we're, we're not going to them saying, "I'm really having trouble hunting. I'm really having it's just I just can't hit a monkey to save my soul." Okay, you know that's not what we're going for. We're going for other purposes. And and interestingly enough, while spiritual exploration per se has not been a well-noted uh, purpose for consuming ayahuasca, that's a purpose that we see a lot of now. We mm -hmm. see it in the UDV church. We see it with Santo Daimi. We see it with people who have meditation and yoga practices and spiritual practices who get involved with ayahuasca because of the tremendous thoroughness and speed and intensity and power of the medicine. Um, so we're reshaping it and it is reshaping us and it is a, a back and forth exchange here. That's really interesting. I like how you mentioned that because I think often it is kind of conceptualized as a one way street, but that's really interesting. Uh, the next question here is from Michelle Adderby. I'm studying the use of psychedelics for my master's thesis. As you described the rich ceremonial process and the depth of respect and humility towards the plant spirits being so important, what are your thoughts on the non-ceremonial process of therapeutic use in the West? Well, look, non-ceremonial non uh, utilization of psychedelics obviously <clears throat> is a, a profoundly beneficial thing. I mean, we know this from thousands of papers that were written in the 50s on exactly this. Um, you know, people using LSD, people using psilocybin, people using ibogaine. I mean, all of this was available therapeutically in the 50s and uh, psychiatrists were writing about it like mad. Um, the very touching documentary, Becoming Cary Grant, about his experience uh, over a hundred uh, assisted LSD therapy sessions where he was really able to get through things that had dogged him his whole life. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. There's no question that the psychedelics um, have vital roles to play in helping people, uh, people who are broken, uh, people who are suffering terribly due to traumas, due to things that they just can't leave behind that in some way inhibit their happiness. Um, and, and I do think that the uh, the therapeutic scene is just going to get better and better. But also a cautionary note, you know, I, I was giving a talk to a group of people from Naropa Institute uh, about a month and a half ago, and uh, several of them were studying to become psychedelic assistance therapists. And I said, so tell me, how many trips are you required to do before you can guide somebody, you know, in psychedelics? And the answer was absolutely none. So what I think is that um, what I want in a shaman, I want somebody who's experienced. I want somebody who's trained. I want somebody who's smart. I want somebody who has my best interests at heart, somebody who knows what they're doing, somebody who's compassionate. And with a therapist, with a psychedelics assistant therapist, I sure as hell want somebody who's tripped a few dozen times. Otherwise, I have no idea if they can really appreciate what somebody's going through when their head's being eaten off by a psychedelic jaguar and you know they're being dissolved into some sort of a silvery mercurial liquid that's spreading out like a, a pond in all directions and seeping through little tiny you know nanomolecular holes in the soil and giving root to you know exotic fungi i mean you better know what the hell you're doing when you're dealing with somebody like that it's not like hey how you feeling you want a sandwich you gotta know what's up yeah, your MDs and PhDs don't really mean much when you're in that situation. <laughs> no, no. And yet, you know, when you have 
I mean, I've seen some really wonderful moments with some, some shamans when people have just been having terrible experiences, <laughs> terrible, and the shaman sits oh. down and does a soap lar and sings and takes all that panic down and relieves the pain and calms the situation and harmonizes it out. That's the kind of skill I'm looking for. Yeah, that really speaks to the, the important role of music like you mm. alluded to in your presentation, which I'd love to maybe come back to if we have time or maybe there'll be some more questions about that. Um, but in the interest of time, and since we do have some more questions, I'll keep running through here. So we got another one from Lisa Marie Perswad. And she says, greetings, Chris, from Phoenix, Arizona. When experiencing the geometric patterns and spirits of the animals and plants within the forest, do you get the sense that your consciousness is projecting onto the experience or interfacing with other forms of consciousness? I get the experience that I am immersed in a field of activity and that it's constantly changing. And that at one moment I might be seeing the wheels of time and another I might be seeing a luminous anaconda and another I might have an experience of great acceleration or, you know, um, being blown to pieces by light and love. I mean, but, but it's, for me, it's always immersion. I'm not typically uh, removed from it, certainly. I mean, that's the beauty of the psychedelic experience, isn't it? That it's profoundly immersive, that it leaves nothing behind. So I, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure it does. I think if it doesn't, uh, Lisa, you can add a follow-up question uh, there. Uh, we'll move up to the next question from Stephanie Rubino. So she asks, where would you suggest someone start if they're interested in embarking in the journey? Um, well, of course, on, on a most immediate basis, you would run out at first light and get my book, The Ayahuasca Test Pilot's Handbook, because that'll give you <laughs> badly needed information. Um, <clears throat> no, seriously, I, I would do that, actually. But uh, also, I would ask around, if you're, if you're interested in ayahuasca because you're interested in healing, or uh, because you have some intuition that it could be spiritually beneficial, then really the biggest task you have is to get to the right place, to get to the right people. Um, it is not the case that somebody who goes down to the Amazon and drinks 10 times is qualified to pour and lead ceremony. That's just not the case. Um, you know, it's just like not everybody who can pump gas can work on a racing car. <laughs> It's just not the same thing, okay? So you really need to know what you're doing. Um, so I would say that the first thing is to identify a great place to go. Uh, somebody or somebodies you can feel safe with because you want to feel safe. You want to be in good hands. You want to be in good company when you're embarking on these journeys because these journeys are profound and they're very immersive and you don't want to have to worry about, you know, being in a place that maybe isn't right or being with people who aren't ethical. You want all that stuff taken care of. So that would be the first stuff I'd be looking at. I'd be, I'd be all over that. Um, and then whether you read my book or any of the other uh, primer books on ayahuasca, I'd encourage you to read up. So you have some basic sense of what the medicine is, what the shamans do, what, you know, some of the things about the tradition, just so you can be familiar with it. Because, you know, this is not like going to get your teeth cleaned. I mean, <laughs> this is a very, very different experience than that. And for many people, and certainly not for everybody, but for many people, it is one of those colossal, life-changing experiences that is so profound and so rich and so radiant that you want to get as much value from it as you possibly can. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure we can, um, we'll share the link to the book in the chat here. And Stephanie, who asked that question, says uh, thank you. And she thinks that's a great start for sure. sure. Uh, looking at the time, I think we might have time for one or two more questions. We've okay. got one here from Tim Sweeney. Uh, he says, is it accurate to say that plants are not physically addictive in their natural form? Um, 
it seems like it's science that takes a plant and reduces it down to its most addictive compound. Well, human beings tinker with plants like nothing else, okay? I mean, you take an opium poppy, sooner or later, you work at it hard enough, you're going to have some crystalline substance that you can boil in a spoon and inject in your arm. Um, we, we just play with plants endlessly. I, I would agree with you that um, <clears throat> for the most part, plants, uh, you know, are more harmful in their, well, or plant compounds, once they've been tinkered with, are more harmful than the plants themselves. But also there are exceptions to that. I mean, if you look at something like toe, brugmansia, um, or, or datura, which are rich in toxic tropane alkaloids, in really small amounts, uh, toe can be used in ayahuasca to kind of add a little bit of a spookiness to it, which it does. Um, but you know, you drink a tea of, uh, toe, if it's too concentrated, you can die. If you drink, uh, if you take a cigar and you soak it in a glass of water overnight and you drink that water in the morning, you'll die in about an hour. So yeah, in general, I would say that it is the purification and the pharmaceuticalization and the synthes synthesizing of things that creates greater toxicity for sure. But I would also have to say that there are some hilariously toxic plants out there. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. I'll squeeze in one more question and then I'll probably turn things over to you from, from any last words you might wanna share with our audience today. So I'm just gonna okay. skip down to one okay. of these questions here. Um, Taylor's asking any suggestions on how the average person can meaningfully support and protect the Amazon and its indigenous communities. I think that you can almost put your hand over your eyes and spin yourself in a circle and throw a dart at any of the good groups that are working on Amazon conservation. Um, you know, for real, uh, okay. there are so many groups, large and small, trying to do good things down there, whether it's the Rainforest Alliance or, or whoever it is. Um, I also think that if you are able, especially when the global pandemic is over, if you're able to go to the Amazon and see some of it for yourself and really get a sense of that, um, you know, that may inspire you to do more. I, I uh, taught at the University of Massachusetts for 14 years. And for the last three years, I took my class to the Amazon rainforest up the Rio Napo. And we did an immersion course uh, and we hung out with shamans and we hiked in the forest at night and we played with snakes and tarantulas and we worked with medicinal plants and we cooked ayahuasca and it was a real scene, I'll tell you. And, and, but what happened was that by virtue of being in that environment, many students became inspired to do something related toward conservation. So I think that going there, if you can, is a big step in inspiring yourself to do that. And I also think helping any of the Amazon conservation projects has to be more beneficial than not. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for sharing uh, so generously today and just sh giving us so much insight and clarity into such an amazing world that I think so many people really have no idea what truly you know goes on in the Amazon so it's just it's amazing to hear your side of the story and all of your perspectives from your travels and experiences so thank you so much for being here well thank you Michael and and I'd also like to say to everybody who has joined in today I, I really appreciate your being here you know this is it's funny I was talking with my wife when I when I reflect on my life plant spirit has given me virtually everything it's given me a living it's given me global travel as a result of those, I've made hundreds of friends. It's introduced me to medicines, to extraordinary ceremonies and celebrations and places of beauty. Plant spirit is a rich, deep, boundless ocean. And with the psychoactive plants, uh, you know, we're, we're covering here in this uh, four-part series with kava and cannabis and coca coming up. Um, we have an opportunity to 
not only go into the chemistry and to go into the history, but to dive into the spirit, into what, you know, ultimately, what do we carry forward if we engage in a, a healing ceremony with ayahuasca, for example? What do we carry forward from that? What do we take with us on into life? Um, you know, how do we carry the medicine? And I hope for people who are here tonight that whatever your experiences are with ayahuasca or with the other psychedelics, that they're safe, that they're joyful, that they're harmonizing, and that you wind up being better equipped to carry the medicine your way in your time and in your life. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Incredible. Thank you so much, Chris. Take good care, everybody. All right, so to close off the session today, I would love to thank Chris again for joining us to launch this series and for sharing his unique perspectives and knowledge around these really interesting topics. I would also love to share a big thanks to the volunteers that make up Maps Canada. There are a lot of moving parts behind the scenes and it does take a team to make something like this happen. We're going through quite a big transition at the moment and in more ways than one, and it has been amazing to see everyone step up and contribute their dedication and passion to this shared cause. Uh, specifically, I wanna thank Kenny behind the scenes on tech and also a special thanks to Shannon Smidella who helped organize the expert edition series. Shannon also hosted both seasons of our webinar to date and did an amazing job laying the foundation for what is to come. Thank you to everyone that has brought as you might know, research is very expensive and the psychedelic renaissance is built on a, on a foundation of solid research into psychedelics. To continue the momentum and build a strong case for psychedelic use, more research needs to be done. And so we appreciate any and all donations that are made as these go directly to support this important research. Tune in next week for our second expert edition series um, episode where Chris will be discussing Kava. Thank you to everyone for attending and we will see you on the next episode.